The worst cost of living crisis in a generation, three prime ministers in as many years, a failing NHS, tensions across the union and continued economic and political fallout from Brexit. The United Kingdom is experiencing one of its most turbulent times in recent history. To the international observer, these conditions would seem rife for widespread industrial action or civil unrest. However, despite the ongoing strikes by some public sector workers and a scattering of climate change protests, there does not appear to be any sense of revolution in the air. For the most part, civil order has been maintained. There has not been a general strike or national rioting, and for the moment at least, the political status quo seems in place. To understand the UK's surprising lack of civil disorder, we need to draw a comparison with a nation that was born from revolution. A nation where collective action is a way of life, and where protest is a core element of the nation's identity. In this video, we're going to explore the contrasting history, society and cultural attitudes in France and the UK, and uncover the three reasons these nations experience such differing levels of civil unrest, before we answer the question, can the UK expect widespread unrest in the coming months? French protests differ in a number of key ways from the British. For one, French protests and riots are far more frequent than in the UK. There have been ongoing yellow vest protests since 2018, the 2022 cost of living protests, and the 2023 pension age protests. In fact, May Day, France's Labour Day on the 1st of May, is an annual day of demonstrations and trade union protests. French protests are also larger and far more militant than those in the UK. An estimated 3 million people have taken part in the Yellow Vest protests. And these protests involve the blocking of roads and fuel depots, the disabling of traffic enforcement cameras, and in some case developing into full-blown riots. The contrast in violence of French and British protests is best exemplified by the differing police response. In France, tear gas, rubber bullets and water cannons are regularly used to control the large crowds at protests. However, these methods are not used by British police, apart from in the special case of Northern Ireland. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, French protests actually achieve their goals far more often than those in the UK. The May 1968 general strike forced Charles de Gaulle to flee to Germany. The 1995 general strike resulted in an increase in the minimum wage. The Yellow Vest protests halted Macron's rise in the carbon tax. The largest protests in UK history, by contrast, have not been able to achieve their stated goals. Protests against the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, the former being the largest protest in British history, failed to prevent the UK's participation in the US-led invasions. Wide-scale demonstrations following the Brexit result failed to force a second referendum. Trade unions could not prevent austerity, whilst nuclear disarmament and fox hunting demonstrations have been fruitless. In fact, the only major protest, in recent British history at least, to achieve its goal was the 1990 poll tax riots, the country's 10th largest protest on record against Thatcher's widely unpopular reforms to taxation. Now that we know how French protests are larger, more frequent and more effective than those in the UK, Let's delve into the history of these nations to start to understand why they have such different attitudes. In the late 1700s, the French monarchy was overthrown in the French Revolution, replacing Louis XVI with a republican government. France's first republic would last just 12 years before Napoleon Bonaparte proclaimed himself emperor and ushered in the first French empire, five years after he first rose to power through a coup d'etat. Following Napoleon's defeat at Waterloo and exile on St Helena, the House of Bourbon was restored, with Louis XVI's brother Louis XVIII and later Charles X taking the throne until 1830, when they were again overthrown by the French people in what came to be known as the July Revolution. Following the July Revolution, a constitutional monarchy under Louis Philippe was established. This would end in a third French Revolution in 1848, which overthrew the government and established the French Second Republic. In 1852, Napoleon Bonaparte's nephew, Napoleon III, would seize power in a coup d'etat and establish the Second French Empire until 1870, when decisive defeat in the Franco-Prussian War led to the establishment of a third French Republic. Of course, this would not be the final junction in French history. When Nazi Germany defeated France in World War II, the Third Republic came to an end. But following the liberation of France, the Fourth Republic was established. However, this also failed and was replaced by a fifth republic in 1958 during the Algerian War. 
The last 250 years has seen France experience three revolutions, occupations by foreign powers, and a total of ten different forms of government, including two empires, three periods of monarchy, and five republics. The United Kingdom, by contrast, has existed as a constitutional monarchy throughout this entire time frame, with the monarch being the head of state and the prime minister being the elected head of government. Since the time of the French Revolution, the UK has seen 44 prime ministers and 8 monarchs, with a peaceful transition of power between each. Instead of a popular uprising overthrowing the system and rewriting the constitution, rights have slowly been extended to the British people through reform, with voting rights extended first to middle class men and then working class men and women through acts of parliament in the 19th and early 20th century. In this sense, the UK and France have contrasting attitudes towards change, with French political history being characterised as revolutionary, whilst the UK's has been reformist. This feeds into an idea in British political theory called traditionalist conservatism, based on the works of Edmund Burke, which emphasises the importance of tradition and authority, and that the nation-state is akin to an organism that evolves naturally over time through incremental reform. Any traditional British institution, whether that be the monarchy, House of Commons or the church, has survived and stood the test of time, so therefore must be necessary and valuable to the society as a whole, and should not be dismantled overnight through revolution, much in the same way the organs in a human body each provide value to the organism as a whole, and must evolve over time, rather than be artificially removed. French social housing, sometimes referred to as Bonlou or HLMs, are housing projects that were largely built following the Second World War around the country's largest cities, such as Paris, Marseille and Lyon. These areas are characterised by high levels of crime, poverty and unemployment, especially among the youth. Unlike in the UK, whose cities were devastated by Luftwaffe bombing campaigns during the Second World War, French cities were left largely intact. So these new developments were made round the city, far away from the centre. It is this geographical alienation and a sentiment that those in HLMs are excluded from mainstream society that leaves the population with civil unrest and protest as the only method of having their grievances heard. This inequality and an idea of two Frances directly contradicts the French promise and aspiration for equality and fraternity. Add to this the poor relationship between the communities and the police, and a history of police brutality, and it is understandable why some of France's largest protests and riots have started in these areas, such as the riots in 1981, 2005 and 2020, and most recently the June 2023 riots following the fatal shooting of teenager Nahel Mazouk by the police in Nanterre, a suburb of Paris. There are also claims of institutional racism against the ethnically diverse populations in Bonlou, including problems getting jobs, housing, and even difficulty entering public places such as bars and nightclubs, which adds to the economic and social segregation. At the time of the 2005 riots, Bonlou's exceeded 20% unemployment, compared with a national average of 8%. However, this stood at more like 40% in some housing estates. This has led many political commentators to suggest French society is characterised by a form of apartheid, with former French Prime Minister Manuel Valls likening the state to a territorial social ethnic apartheid. What makes the social isolation even worse is that, unlike the UK or the US, it is illegal to collect most forms of data on ethnicity and race in France, meaning that any claims of institutional racism cannot be confirmed by census data, making it difficult for reform to take place. It is clear that those in French housing estates may feel so isolated from mainstream French society that protest is their only option to be heard. Of course, housing estates in the UK have sparked some of the UK's largest episodes of civil unrest, notably the 2011 riots following the death of Mark Duggan. However, the geographical location of the UK's social housing closer to the centre of major cities and lower levels of unemployment mean that we see these episodes of widespread civil unrest from the youth far less often. This may come as a surprise, however France actually has far lower rates of union membership than other comparable Western European countries, 
Just 9% of workers are unionised in France, compared with 17% in Germany and 23% in the UK. So what makes French unions so powerful? How can we see widespread worker protests like the Gilets Jaunes with such low union membership? This seems counterintuitive. If trade union membership is so low in France, then how come their unions can wield so much power over government policy? The first key difference here is that French unions have far more direct bargaining power with employers than in the UK. The concept of dialogue social means whenever the government wants to carry out an economic or social reform, they must consult the trade unions and business representatives. Also, all companies with over 50 employees, regardless of if the employees are in a trade union, are represented by an elected union delegate who sit on a work council and are consulted by bosses on a daily basis. So therefore, if we look at collective bargaining coverage, the proportion of people in a country's population whose terms and conditions at work are made by collective bargaining between an employer and a trade union rather than by individual contracts, 98% of French workers are covered, compared with 54% in Germany and just 26% in the UK. This enables for widespread striking and industrial action if talks fall through, something that is far more difficult in the UK where this system is not in place. With the UK's Employment Act of 1980, only those directly part of the dispute could join the picket lines and made secondary sympathetic strikes, those at other companies in solidarity, illegal. Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher also made closed shops illegal, situations where companies would require employees to be part of a specific trade union, weakening the direct bargaining power many unions had with their employees. The illegality of secondary action in the UK means that individual strikes, such as what we are seeing with rail workers and nurses at the moment, cannot spill over into a general strike that brings the whole nation to a standstill. This goes a long way in explaining why, despite the economy going through such difficult times in the UK, it is not experiencing anything like the Gilets Jaunes or the student-led 2009 general strike in France. This resonates perfectly with the third word of France's tripartite motto, liberty, egality, fraternity. Fraternity, this brotherhood and solidarity that is core to the French identity, is perfectly displayed in the fact that workers from all different industries across the public and private sector regularly join arms to display a general distaste for government action. So, with all that in mind, can the UK expect greater amounts of civil unrest in the coming months and years? If recent surveys are anything to go by, it certainly looks like it. It mainly has to do with the British public's relationship with the police. According to the Mayor's Office, in 2014, 77% of Londoners felt the police could be relied upon, but by 2022, that had fallen to just 57%. Not only are perceptions of the police falling, but on the ground, citizens are having worse interactions with authorities. Since 2017, the annual amount of stop and searches in England and Wales has increased from 300,000 to 700,000, whilst at the same time the proportion of those that led to arrests have fallen from 17 to 11%. This means not only are there more people who do not trust the police, but hundreds of thousands of innocent people have had negative experiences with law enforcement through stop and search. The police are not the only institution going through a popularity crisis in the UK. The UK government's approval rating stands at a diabolical 14%. The current Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, has not won an election as leader of his party and was not even his party's first choice. Truss won the membership election following Johnson's resignation but had to step down following a string of policy failures. It is this cocktail of poor economic conditions, an unpopular government and mistrust in the police force which means the UK's peaceful run may be coming to an end. 